Hello, my friends. I'm Rick, and this is your See the Table, and we are looking at the House Liao Handbook. And I believe this is for 3060, 3062 is the year that these are for. So this would be after the, so the Fedcom Civil War is over with. Uh, the clans are basically in the middle of their reaving era of fighting in, among themselves and between them and their home clans and sorting themselves out. Uh, isn't it ironic that every time that the that a house fac, a, a major faction figures that one major threat is finished and and uh, in you know contained that it's okay to open up a front on somebody else. I mean, that's one of the things I take away from the, the, no sooner is the, you know, look at the jihad. I'm still reading a lot of material on the jihad. And uh, we've got this rogue word of Blake that's assaulting everybody and doing some pretty horrific things. And yet, even while they're doing it, elements within various houses are taking the opportunity to do, uh, go on the offensive themselves. Only battle tech. All right, only the human situation would sit, you know, go through that. So obviously, this one here is a PDF, and uh, it was graciously uh, 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 given to me by somebody. And uh, I have two more. I actually have the the Steiner and the Davion hardback versions of this series. Uh, I also have the PDF for uh, the Draconis Combine. The one I don't have yet is the Free Worlds Link. Now I have to go and see if I can if if I can find it. And because uh, I know I, I know I can order it off of Catalyst. It's twenty five damn dollars, and and I, I hope to not have to get to that point. But if I have to, then so be it. Uh, one of the things that I liked about this was this because this tidied up a lot of things that was going on. Uh, at the time in 2002-2003 when uh, I stepped away from uh, the, the game table uh, in Battletech specifically, the, uh, there was so much unanswered material. So when I started reading the Dark Age and they made that leap forward, like I said, it was like a whole lot of things had been left undone. There was uh, so much going on after the Fed Com Civil War was coming to a conclusion and prior to the Jihad breaking out uh, that the, the fact that they sent, that they had just leapt 100 years or 75 years into the future uh, with a whole other set of, uh, of, of scenarios and lore, I, I, I was struggling to keep... I, I, get my bearings on that stuff. I was kind of dis was well, I was not kind of, I was really disillusioned by it. So this is the attempt to, to tidy those loose ends up and create it into a, a period piece. So now we have the 3062 era, which is post-Clan invasion, post-Fedcom Civil War, prelude to that uh, that nastiness that becomes the jihad. And so from the house Liao, a lot of the information that I found in here is just an updated, a reworded version of the earlier history and mechanics of how the house works, how their economy, their judicial system, their government, things like that works, which is great because once again, new generations of people come along and don't have access to that old, older stuff that, that we have. Uh, this is great for them. And for us older folks, this is great too because it, it just continues that, that's that big part of Battletech that makes it so, I don't want to say unique or special, but makes it so popular is the continuity of the lore. There isn't some big huge gaps where we just reset things or uh, we just you know go off into some other world and now we've got two separate uh, parallel universes crap. No, they do make an effort to try to tie in everything. So this is what this series does is brings the end, puts to, to bed the confusing mess that was left by Fass's departure and, uh, and the leap forward to of the jihad are being past tense and all this all being past tense so i was i read through this fairly fairly quickly for me i actually uh found it quite fascinating and it didn't uh so when i get into something i'll keep doggedly going at it so obviously something i'm going to have to go back at some point and uh reread because obviously like i said it's like a good movie you go to the movie for the first time for the entertainment factor you read the novel for the entertainment factor it's not till you come back and you read it for the third time that you start noticing these little things that you you skipped over or sped past while in the process of enjoying the the entire item at least that's just my opinion anyway. So 
we have a series of different maps from different eras which is great. I thought I, I like to see these inclusions because uh, the older books didn't. Well, they didn't have a reason to do it, or they just hadn't thought about it. So this kind of really puts into terms when you when you look at something like uh, the Confederation itself, uh, just how much it shrank from its heyday, from its heyday to its current version. <coughs> excuse me, to its 30, 30, 30 version where it's about a half of it. it's a shadow of its former self and you can see where those boundaries are being chipped away and chipped away and how much it's it's paid its price over the centuries the fact it's still in play is a testament to both its people and its ruling house i mean that's just be this just be the the raw, the raw fact of it if the population of the people truly hated being under the compelling uh, or the house leal as a control house leal wouldn't be in power I mean, even the most, even the most diehard uh, dictators can end up be, getting eliminated, and it happens over and over and over again. So we're talking about uh, uh, Sun Tzu, and in a lot of ways, he's a real genius. He's one of those rare Liao's that possess that. You know, he's undersold. A lot of people look down at him, uh, especially some of his antics when he was younger. And we learn later that a lot of those, some of those antics were actually intentionally driven to uh, create the illusion that he was a bit of a nut job and and not stable. And also as a part to deflect his truly unstable mother's attention uh, when she got angry. So I mean, he had to, to navigate a pretty pretty sticky uh, growing up period and even worse uh, uh, cutthroat uh, shark infested uh, swamp that is uh, you know cyan so the fact that he does it comes out comes out on top uh, he's able to conduct deals to find additional forces and this brings us with this alliance with the, the magistry of Canopus and eventually a relationship uh, that's that's a political pending political marriage or a political marriage uh, a marriage of convenience mostly for the convenience of, of uh, the uh, compelling confederation and then by default trying to bring in the torn concordat as well which uh, for a while works and allows uh, sons out to borrow you know, tap some troops from these two periphery nations to help fight uh, and gain territory for the conf uh, confederation uh, necessarily not so he has to put his own troops in uh, harm's way but uh, just you know pretty uh, pretty sad pretty slick so by the end of the conclusion of the four succession you can if you have not seen that if you have never seen you compare you know this is after the first first uh, succession war and you can see the borders here where they've already lost worlds to to their their neighbors so compare that to that just just shows you it really puts in perspective just how bad uh, things had got for house uh, for house layout and how far they come is when the, that later map pops up and he shows the gains that they've made uh, after uh, Sun Tzu starts to recover and take advantage of uh, the the the, con the conflict there between the, the the dissolving federated sons as well as other issues going on at the time, the other thing the Confederation has been very very fortunate with, and, and I'm just being honest. Uh, you know, there's a there's an, uh, a often spoken meme when it comes to uh, the free uh, Razor Hog Republic. That that the the uh, razzle hag is always meant to be subservient to somebody else. The concept that they're going to be having, they're going to be a true and free and and uh, 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 potent uh, whatever the, in the grand scheme of the inner sphere is never going to happen. It's just a delusion on their part. And the closest they ever come to anything like that is when Ghost Bear basically uh, melds with them or comes in and uh, takes them under their 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 shoulder or arm or whatever you want to call it uh, and we get the uh, uh, ghost bear dominion and it's the only point in time the, the, the razzle hog has many really success and they're still under somebody else's control indirectly directly semantics it doesn't matter the confederation on the other hand has never been under anybody's control although guards large portions of it has been captured and controlled by their neighbors uh, over the centuries. That's not 
goes without saying. But the fact that the Confederation has always been designed to be, quote, the boogeyman, before the clans came, uh, the Capellans were almost always considered the black hats. And unless you're in the Capellan Confederation uh, camp and you see them as the scrappy underdogs that are doing anything and everything they need to do to keep on going, uh, and, and there's a lot to be said to that. But uh, the truth is, uh, Ragaz, well, Raza Hogs, they're, they're just meant to be uh, subject, subjects and the Capellans are not. And this is a great example of just how, how savvy and capable. So the 3030s had Hans Davion and the 3060s has uh, Suns Out. And Suns Out really goes a long way to reconstituting everything his country, his, his uh, house lost uh, since the Fourth Succession War. So, again, through the history, timeline of the Fourth Succession War, uh, you gotta read the novels uh, the, for, to really get the impact of how all this plays out. Uh, history of the Nation, Closer to Isis Merrick. He's dabbling at this point. He's dabbling with the possibility of marrying Isis, Isis Merrick, which would be another political. Uh, he's trying to. He's trying to gain uh, uh, connect up with the Free Worlds League, which is never going to happen. And then he comes to that conclusion and starts looking at the uh, Canopens and and the Turns as an alternative. Uh, periphery interests. We start talking about it. Uh, the Star League reborn, uh, reborn, and. Uh, Zin Xing. So Zeng Zhao becomes first lord of the star of the reconstituted Star League and immediately starts figuring out ways he can take advantage of that to make sure the Compellans uh, get to get the best of everything. And uh, like I said, one of the things that the Compellants have not had to deal with is a direct head-on threat of any of the clans, to my knowledge. Uh, now this may have taken place in some series in, the, in over the last 20 years that I'm not aware of, but everything I've read so far, nothing indicates that any one particular clan has made an effort to crush and take over the Confederation or absorb it like they have other places, the Outwards Alliance, the, the FFR, just an example, right? So... You know, there's something worth having. And so Sun Zhao begins to set up what he's going to, a, a whole slew of wheels within wheels scenarios to help build up his military, build up his population, and build up his economy to get prepared to take it when the first opportunities present itself to regain territory. And he does that through political manipulation and questionable under the table uh, dealings to basically reclaim the St. Ives Compact for the Feder uh, for the Confederation and uh, make efforts to get Tychon the Tychonoff uh, commodity back because those two are pretty pretty potent additions to uh, the Confederation and it really matters and so we see a lot of that come out during this particular era. This, this was like I said uh, was an excellent read and uh, I was really fascinated by a lot of what had uh, right so here it is Compelling Confederation after the Fedcom Civil War 3067. So basically they were down to this, this section here. Now he's regained here, here, and up here. There's still quite a bit yet to just to get back to the, to the fourth, prior to the fourth succession war era. A long way to go if they're going to try to get back to the original Star League era, which is never going to happen. So we get into a sub-chapter of touring the stars. So we get a breakdown of uh, some of the commodities and their main their main planets and things that are going on there. And I always like planetary bios uh, in part because it gives us so much information on uh, the atmosphere of the flavor of a given world and what we can kind of expect if we need to set a campaign uh, or some kind of operation on one of these things. Uh, so basically that's what we're going through is a overview of a handful of the literal hundreds of worlds. I don't know the exact world count for the Federated, or for uh, the uh, Confederation as of 3067. I know that just prior to the Fourth Succession War, they had roughly th almost 400 planets, three something. I did a whole video on this crap long, like a year back. So uh, they are constant. They're concentrated. Their planets are close together. Their systems are close together. Uh, that makes it easier for them to move stuff around, as opposed to where their opponents. It also makes the 
their territory, though it looks smaller on a map, actually more robust than what it appears if, at first glance because there actually has such a almost on par with most of their neighboring houses for numbers of planets and access to resources and things of that nature. They're actually financially and resource rich compared to the uh, the uh, Caridans. You know, they're not going to be the Steiners. Nobody's going to be the Steiners. Yeah, I'll tell the current era, because right now the Steiners are not the Steiners hardly anymore, really. So we can talk about the, the breakdown of the government, their roles. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions that the Chancellor is the dictator of the Confederation, and it doesn't really work out that way. Uh, they have a lot of control, and they have a lot of influence, and they can bend a lot of arms or break a lot of knees, uh, but they're not the all. And, and that's a foolhardy thing to consider. Uh, any kind of entity the size of these house factions, they're so, they're so vast. The distance between their worlds is so vast. It, it's not practical to have a, a single controlling element in one place and everybody you know you need other layers of people to make that will happen and to keep the rule of, of law and government's uh, consumption in, in you know in one ha in one hand so talk about their nobility system which is is a bit convoluted but it's no different than most of the other houses everybody's got their own noble system how it plays out you know and we break into the military, the current military, and it, and this, the con, the Confederation's military is actually more robust now in a lot of elements than it was in uh, the Fourth Succession War. I mean, Sun Tzu has gone a long way to building his sources and resources up, and his military, and so on and so forth. I mean, right on, you know, society and culture. These you don't find these in the field manual versions or the combat manuals, I would guess. I have only got one of those as a PDF, and I haven't had time to really look at it. But, you know, the difference between this and this is this stuff. It's just giving us that flavor, that feel of what makes the Confederation, what makes its people, its people, how they operate, how they how they view themselves, how they view the rest of the inner sphere. And uh, if you're going to operate and play as a compel as a representative representative of of uh, House Lee Hour uh, of the Compelling Confederation, this stuff's valuable. If you want to play in character, if you want to immerse yourself in, uh, well, that's not a very that's not the sort of thing. Uh, uh, a Capellan would do. Okay, how do we know what they would do? Well, we get an idea of what they might want to do. Their economy, their major corporations. We're going to come into a section that I'm, I'm really pleased to see. I started seeing these start to crop up. So after 2000, apparently, somebody, somebody somewhere come up with the idea that, you know, we need to add just a little bit more stuff. I think MechWarrior plays its role in that. So now we have a, an addition for some creatures and, you know, Flora and fauna, specifically of fauna that can be found on various planets in and around the Confederation. And as always, these are neat things. I mean, I really enjoy reading them, and uh, it gives you ideas on some stuff. We got more equipment, stuff that's oriented or, const or constructed within, manufactured within the Confederation. It may only be available to the Confederation, except through uh, black, black market channels. You know, and then of course we get our rules annex. We get a support vehicle here. Uh, it's kind of a almost. Uh, I don't know. It's definitely futuristic. I was trying to think. I want to say Running Man, but uh, that's probably not. No, it's not Running Man. One more Schwarzenegger goes to Mars. Anyway, uh, surveillance VTL. That was it goes without saying. You imagine there's quite a few of those. And then we got some rules annex. The black market. Confederation values of we're all in this together. Regional views, once again, things that give you a, a better idea of how and why the Confederation is what it is and, and how it's working inside. And considering how diverse and how uh, uh, draconian, and it's diverse and draconian at the same time the Confederation can be in a lot of aspects when it comes to s society and social issues and social mores, uh, they're not the hot mess that the Federated Sons is by a minute. It just goes to show you how different these factions, these, war these, these house factions are from each other. So all kinds of nifty stuff, some salt craft. Uh, I always like to see the additions of things that are not mechs. Don't be wrong, I love my mechs. Mechs are the bomb, right? But there's more to the universe than just mechs. And so we're seeing 
some of those things here now and how they would be applied and how they would be used, etc., etc. So, like I said, you know, a nice little section back here. I didn't print this out in color, but you know, some nice additional artwork and things like this. So, long live the Confederation. Till next time, this is Rick. Going on, my friends. This is Rick. And hey, if you like the channel, please hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the like button, tell your buddies, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, tell anybody else that's in the 